can you take us behind the scenes of the Jimmy Fallon thing? Oh, no. oh. oh. who's dead? <gasps> not me. Oh my God, not Ray. Ray. It is one of those things again where people are like, that was a really smart marketing move on your part. We're like, nope, they just reached out. <laughs> Just, they just reached out to us and were like, Jimmy's interested in playing Among Us. What can you tell us about it? And it's like, oh, okay. So I hopped onto a call with them. It had blown up on TikTok and everywhere. So it's wild that they did that all with three people. I don't think anything we ever make again will be as big as Among Us and that's okay. And honestly, it's much less terrifying to think about it that way. <laughs> <laughs> How did you grow the Among Us TikTok account to over 4 million followers? I know people talk about like, you know, post quality over quantity, which I agree with, but sometimes you need the quantity in order to check like, oh, this is what quality means. Welcome to Inside the Creator Studio, an origin story podcast about the world's best video content creators. My name is Mo O'Keefe. And my name is Katie Kane. On today's episode, we have Victoria Tran, the community director of the hit game Among Us, which a while ago was the most popular game ever in terms of monthly active users. She's also a speaker and writer on the topic of community management in the games industry and was on the Forbes 30 Under 30s list in 2022. We're going to talk to Victoria about her origin story, how she grew the Among Us TikTok page to over 4 million followers, and what it was like to play with AOC during a live stream in the middle of the pandemic, which turned out to be one of the most successful live streams in Twitch history. She's also going to take us behind the scenes of streaming with Jimmy Fallon. This show is brought to you by StreamYard, a browser-based tool that lets you live stream to multiple platforms and record remote podcasts in studio quality. It's built for creators to make your job way easier. And it's what we use to record this podcast. And just so everybody knows, we are re-recording this intro because I was having some technical difficulties. So that's why we look like this and not where you're going to see in the preamble and the rest of the episode. I would be interested for the preamble, like, Tell yeah. me about your experience playing Among Us. I haven't actually played it yet. But <gasps> you, you never have. played it? I've never played it. But like, so, tell me about your experience playing it. So um, I played it during the pandemic with a group of friends that I had made in like my last semester of college. And one day they were like, let's play. And they were like, yeah, let's sign into Discord. And I was like, what's Discord? Like, I did not know. It was like May 2020. And we were playing and it was so fun. But the first time I played... I was the imposter, which is like so hard to learn the rules of the game because it's like, have you ever played a uh, mafia? Yeah, it's like mafia, but it's like you're supposed to kill people the first time you play mafia and you're like, how does this work? So the whole time I'm like, what am I doing? I don't know what I'm doing, but I had so much fun and we just kept doing it. Um, I, I, I'm so like not as equipped to talk about the game world as I maybe could be, but it is super fun and I would recommend playing it. Um, Victoria, welcome to the show. Um, <laughs> thanks for being here. We got to zoom in perfectly on that because that was a perfect little <laughs> intro clip. Super cute. Um, we love to start this show with rapid fire questions. So try to keep your answers to a few sentences. Okay. Um, I actually really like these. I crafted them myself. So I'm super excited to see your answers on this. Which color of the crewmates would you be? Brown. Nice. What's your favorite task in the game? Ooh, um, connecting the water. Uh, no, uh, roasting marshmallows. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like being a crewmate or an imposter more? Oh, crewmate, 100%. Nice. Better yet, a ghost. No pressure. Oh, I like being a ghost too. That's always fun. <laughs> Um, what is your favorite game that Inner Sloth doesn't make? Ooh, tough. Um, currently, I am s super addicted to a game called Peglin. Okay, sweet. What is that game? It is like a roguelike pachinko game. Nice. Cool. Well, you're really great at keeping things 
really short. You you did that perfectly. So there you go. I Perfect. you know I hear the assignment. I'm like I gotta I gotta <laughs> rapid fire. <laughs> Yeah. Let me make it even quicker so than short. you expect. No, I love it. Um, so we're done with rapid fire because that was so quick. Love it. There we go. Um, Did I so speed you... run rapid fire questions? <laughs> did I win? Absolutely. Did I you won. Rapid I fire? think you won. I think you did. Yeah. You won. Perfect. You completed the task. You won. The crewmates <laughs> won. Um, so you studied to get a bachelor in science. What was your goal initially going into college or university? And how did you get to where you are now from there. It was a Bachelor of Arts. Oh, that's so weird. I don't yeah. know why I saw Bachelor of Science. Maybe I, that's weird. Anyway, why did you, where did you see yourself going from that? My fault. Yeah, no, it's all good. Um, Yeah, so like super quick backstory is that I never thought I would get into games. Like this wasn't a career path that I knew existed, that sort of thing. It was very, um, I call it like traditional Asian household of like, you're a doctor, you're a lawyer, or you're an accountant. And I was like, okay, healthcare it is. So originally I was doing a sociology degree Um with a double minor in communications and social studies of science, or sorry, social studies of medicine uh, in order to do some healthcare stuff. Uh, and then I hated it. <laughs> I had always played games and I really loved games. So I kind of did that thing where in post-graduation, I was like, I'm really depressed. I'm going to apply for anything that I can and just see where it goes. Yeah. Um, and games was a huge one. So I started just looking up game stuff and yeah, that's kind of where it started. That's awesome. Okay, cool. Just FYI, this could have been why if you Google uh, Victoria Tran Bachelor of Science, I saw that there is another Victoria Tran who goes to McGill who's studying science. But really? also, yes, but also the your Forbes under 30 under 30 page says yeah. that you studied Bachelor of Arts slash science. Oh, maybe that's why. Because that's I was so strange. Because I, I like looked at everything that was definitely you. So I was like, oh, that's weird. I definitely saw it in a place where I was like, this is verified information. Wow. I dropped the link in the chat. If you click on the people tab on the right, yeah. Victoria, you'll see it says, if Forbes got what? it wrong. <laughs> a Forbes got it wrong. That's okay. Interesting. Interesting. Sure. Yeah, I, that's probably you know how I'll that happened. Just saying, I'll start saying that I have. <laughs> just say arts and science. <laughs> I've both. I've both. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's so funny. I wonder, yeah, that makes sense. Thanks, Mo, for backing me up. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> <That's team laughs> Co-host right of the year. I was like, great start to a podcast. We have no idea who you are. We thought you were someone else. <laughs> you have no. the wrong Victoria Tran. <laughs> <laughs> and you're the imposter and the and the right Victoria Tran oh, comes in. So that it's would actually be so all on brand. Everything mm -hmm. is on brand right now. Okay. We're we good. plan this, in fact. <laughs> no, Perfect. that's so funny. Um, okay, back to the questions. What was the game that made you want to work in the world of games? Ooh, that's really hard because I think all the games that I've played kind of work my way up into wanting to get into games. I will say that when I was younger, because we couldn't like afford a console or console or anything, um, a lot of like the flash games were really formative for me, right? Like Congregate, Ming, Mini Clip, Newgrounds, like all of those places. Oh my God, yes, 100%. Yeah, they were so big, they were so big to me. So I think um, a lot of that, plus a lot of MMOs that I played, like the free ones. Um, I played Tibia, Same. I played Ragnarok Online, well, not like real work. Anyways. <laughs> oh, right. Um, private servers. <laughs> private servers. Yeah. Uh, because free and we could, you know, it was that time where people were like, you wouldn't submit your information on the internet. Payments <laughs> on the internet must be a scam. Um, so yeah, games like that, I think were really uh, meaningful to me when it came to wanting to work in games. Cool. Yeah. yeah. It took me months to convince my parents to get me a paid RuneScape membership. And like, wow, you play RuneScape? I admired them. Yeah. Or you did? I did. I did. I did. Back back when when they were when like free MMOs around the time Victoria was playing was like the big thing. Mm. <sighs> yeah. That's so funny. So, so for the reason why I ask is because my boyfriend's sister's husband. So like, in he used to my boyfriend used to live with him. So we spent a lot of time together. He's from Scotland. He is still obsessed with RuneScape. <laughs> and this man is 26 years old. And he'll like play eight hours of RuneScape, like buying all the boots. I don't know what any of it means, but he'll show me. And I'm like, this looks like it hasn't been updated in 20 years. <laughs> but maybe that's the appeal, I guess. 
You know, it, sometimes it is. It's the old school stuff. I mean, like people still like like love Neopets and that all that kind of oh, thing. Oh, true. It's great. Mm-hmm. Love mm-hmm. it. <laughs> true. True. Do you remember some of the specific games you played on New 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 Grounds or Mini Clip? Did you play Tamale Loco? Oh my gosh! <laughs> oh, the memories. Yeah, it's like that's the problem. I don't remember the names necessarily. I just know what they looked like or like. Yeah. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Um. I'm trying to think. I don't necessarily. Oh, there was like the balloons game, that monkey <gasps> balloon yes. game. Yeah, that's, that's so funny. Game. Dude, I will put you on something. I don't know if it's on Canadian Netflix, but the okay. other day it said that Netflix has games now. And I saw balloons and I went, what? I was like, that's a blast from the past. Holy crap. I love that. Okay. For non-gamers, could you quickly explain what Among Us is? Yeah. So Among Us is a multiplayer social deduction game. Um, Essentially, you are, you're with your crew. You play with friends or with strangers online um, and you are on a ship and it's, you're trying to make it to your next des- destination, uh, but amongst your crew, there is one person or three um, that are imposters, and they're trying to kill you. They're trying to sabotage the ship, uh, and you have to find out during meetings or during like just kind of you know being suspicious of certain people um, who the imposter is and eject them out before they kill everyone or sabotage the ship. Perfect. And Grant, you could put some B-roll over that. Uh, Grant is our video editor, by the way. If and you, you should if you- put our heads. Yeah. You should put our heads on little oh. crew members <laughs> crew for this up. Yeah. It's so cute. Now, could you tell us the, about the story of how it got so popular and what that trajectory was? Because I know it wasn't. Ne- it didn't necessarily blow up right after launch. Yeah, and a lot of people think that, but the story is actually a lot more interesting than that. And so, I would love for you to tell us, like, take us through that journey, and also at what point you joined the team. For sure. Um, it is it is a complicated mess of lucky coincidences and things coming together. Uh, and I guess not ter- not I mean, yes, terrible things coming together because COVID. Um, but essentially, the game came out in 2018, um, just on mobile and like local only. And the team at the time basically kept working on it. Uh, they added like online play, they added uh, PC stuff. And I believe the first kind of bump was when it got featured on itch.io, uh, where it still still is, um, and a Korean streamer picked it up. And then it kind of gained popularity overseas uh, for them. Um, and then eventually, because of the numbers, uh, at some point, Steam found out about it, and it became a daily deal. So it was 50% off, um, and that did really well for them. And then because of how well it did for them, they also were part of the Steam summer sale, um, and again, that sold a lot of units. And by that time, I think a UK streamer picked it up. And that's kind of how it slowly found its way like to the West um, and from the UK streamers. And because, you know, when you're a streamer, you bring on a bunch of your friends and they tend to be streaming friends. Um, that also happened in the US. And from then on, it started like blowing up and everyone started playing together. And I joined kind of at the height of its popularity in 2020. Maybe not in the summer 2020, like late, early, late summer 2020, early autumn um, is when I joined on because they were looking for someone to help wrangle in the community because they were just a team of three. Um, it was a programmer, a game designer slash artist and an artist. Um, so they were doing like all of the things. So they, they really needed help. And I was I was there. That is wild with mm-hmm. such a small team. I remember playing it in like May of 2020. Mm-hmm. And it, it had blown up on TikTok and everywhere. So yeah. it's wild that they did that all with three people. It's one of those things where no one expected it because they were done with the game by January 2020, I believe. Mm-hmm. So they're like, okay, cool. Well, we'll work on our next game now. Um, and then it started blowing up. And they're like, guess not. <laughs> so <laughs> that's so a, cool. Wild time. And tell us more about the role that like Twitch streamers and other content creators played in that in that growth like obviously it's not directly under your control you like the focus was on like they they just happened to make a game that people really wanted to play Mm -hmm. but tell us more about that and also if your team did anything to encourage more of that um in full honesty and like this was before i joined i don't think the team necessarily were trying to do anything special in terms of like trying to get 
like streamers play it. They just wanted to make something that was fun for them, for their friends, for the people that they care about, and for like people who wanted to play. So it was one of those things where it's it's one of those like catch all answers of like we just wanted yeah. they just wanted to make a game that was fun for people to play. And the fact that it worked out with streamers is a really nice coincidence. Um, what was the first part of your question? <laughs> like, what role did streamers play in like helping that growth? And other content creators as well. Yeah, I think it was one of those things where it was such a nice, um, what's the word? Uh, where it's symbiotic, I suppose, because a lot of different streamers, because like you had you played with a lot of your streamer friends, and because you had a lot of interactions and you had a lot of really fun moments, um, we saw a lot of growths in streamers who got really popular playing Among Us, which is awesome, and now they're popular playing other games too, which we love. Um, and then obviously like helping to give Among Us that visibility. And I think the beauty of having the streamers play was that you get a lot of personalities in the room, you get a lot of really fun moments and everyone, you know, who usually people who stream have a personality, know how to entertain. And it's one of those things that it just really shows off the social aspect of the game. Um, and in a game where, I mean, most of the fun, all of the fun, I guess, is in that social aspect and guessing. Um, it was it was really nice. Yeah, that, that's a great answer. And uh, let me break the fourth wall for a minute. Like <laughs> as you're talking, you're looking at the the camera, and I'm curious mm -hmm. if you have like a teleprompter or if you're like making an effort to look at the camera. Oh, I'm, I'm just making curious. an effort to look at the camera. <laughs> Good for oh. you. I always have a hard time doing that. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's one of those things where I've done this enough that I'm like I'm trying to I'm trying to be better about that. So I'm mm -hmm. glad that you noticed. Thank you. Yeah, that's awesome. In October of 2020, to get young people to vote, AOC did an Among Us stream. On Twitch with some of the most popular streamers in the world with Pokimane, Valkyrie, Hassan Piker, and a bunch of others. And this turned out to be like one of the most successful live streams in Twitch history. I think there was around like 400,000 viewers. I'm curious, like if we go back to that moment, what were you and the team uh, doing at, like while this was happening? Had you, had you joined the team at this point? Like were you at the office? Like holy crap, what was happening? So we're, yeah, so we're all remote. Um, I think, so AOC played twice, I believe. Um, the first time I was not part of the team yet, so I wasn't super sure there. Um, the second time when she did it again, I was on the team. Um, and it was just, oh, okay. <laughs> it's, because, it's because, like, I think a lot of people thought that, oh, we had reached out to her. or Oh, this was, like, big marketing thing that we did. It wasn't. It's just someone deciding to play your game. You're like, okay. Okay, uh, I guess we'll watch and we'll see what happens. And it's like any other streamers, you just watch, you like check to and hope nothing's breaking. Um, I got to play a couple of games with her actually, which was really cool. Um, but yeah. How wild is that? Wow, that's just like it's a so really weird. It's so weird. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah, that sounds like it would be a really interesting experience. I guess, what was the response from the rest of the team after? Um, honestly, and I think this is similar to the question when people asked, like, oh, how did it feel, like, having so many players and having the game blow up like this? It's one of those things where it is a normal, it is a strange but technically normal work day. As in, mm. you, I think the brain just can't process like things sometimes so it's like while it's happening you're like oh okay like you're just too focused on like okay i need to make sure the game doesn't break and you make sure like this is okay um if something happens like what am i going to do um and so in the moment you're not really paying attention to it until like suddenly afterward and someone's like oh did you know like you had this many butters and we're like oh no that's why <laughs> yeah 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 that is really crazy i feel like in the midst of a game like you're just focusing on it all happening it's like if you're live streaming um you kind of just have to focus what's on hand and then after the fact it's like oh wow like we really had a ton of response you can't really have that mindset in the middle of something huge like that you know uh -huh. you're too busy trying to put out fires at that point <laughs> yeah seriously seriously um what do you think is the mark of a successful community my personal goal with communities is that i always want to make a space where people feel like they matter and they're heard and they're listened to um even if they are coming from a space of like, you know, different backgrounds and different countries and different values, all that sort of thing. 
um, but hoping that to create like an encouraging positive space where people can learn and grow together um, is something that's quite important to me. That's awesome. a great answer. Um, you talk about this in one of the articles you've written, but for our audience's knowledge, what makes a good community manager? Yeah. Again, it depends. <laughs> yeah. But uh, for me, a good community manager entails quite a few things. One is definitely the communication skills, both written, both verbal. Um, it's one of those things where being able to empathize with people and to know where they're coming from and to be able to relate to them in a way that they understand and that they can connect with is a soft skill that I think a lot of people don't consider too much of a skill. Um, but it really is, especially when, again, you're dealing with people with different ages, coming from different countries, um, understanding things differently from you, um, being able to connect with them is huge. And I think that's basically the number one thing when it comes to community manager. But number two and three, like and the, all the other ones, is um, being able to know the values of your developers and of the studio and what they consider success and being able to kind of drive your own community strategy to um, help with that. While at the same time, you know, thinking of the community values and thinking of the community and what they want um, and marrying those together. Uh, and yeah, and just being able to honestly deal with what comes with being online frequently and talking to people online very frequently. As a follow up to that, do you feel like as a community manager, you need to be someone who's a bit chronically online and kind of have understanding that you can't really learn elsewhere? I think I'm not sure if I would incur. I think chronically online is like a very deep way of being online. That yeah, that's I'm true. Not sure that's like, true. Is healthy? So I'm not, not going to say that you need to be chronically online, but I think you at least if you don't, I don't think you need to know every trend because I think that's impossible. But I think mm -hmm. you need to be able to learn how to adapt your voice and your strategy when it comes to trends, when it, even if you don't participate in them at all, to at least have a deep understanding of like, okay, I get why this is popular or I kind of get why this is funny to people, that sort of thing. So just yeah. a deep understanding. I would say. Every creator has to deal with negative comments, but I feel like you're doing that at the highest like difficulty setting possible because you work in games and like the gaming community is arguably like one of the more toxic communities on the internet. And because of that, I think other creators can learn a lot from your experience because after seeing what you have to deal with, like they might realize their lives are, you know, not as hard. So this is a weird question, but are there any like negative comments that have stuck with you over the years? Like either because they're creative or they were dumb or like they, they hurt, they, they maybe they were true or something like that. Yeah. And I think it's, it's, it's one of those weird things that, I think neither of us, whether it's streamers or community managers, have it easier than the other person necessarily. Um, sometimes as a community manager, you do get very direct comments towards yourself, um, but sometimes you get it towards the studio and then you're like, that's not cool. Um, but then I know like some streamers get very direct comments to their personal lives and that's a huge thing. So yeah, it, it can be, it's a, it's, everyone has it hard, <laughs> but there have definitely been um, comments that have stuck around with me or like, you know, sometimes you have a really bad day and one comment in particular just like gets under your skin. You're like, oh, that's bad. Um, so, yeah, I would say that there is quite a bit. Um, I don't try to ruminate on them for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some that I have saved because I thought they were just kind of funny. But I also have like a folder of really nice things that people have said about either my work or like the studio's work. And you know how people say like the brain will like remember one cr critique yeah. and then the hundreds of compliments that you get, you for like, you forget that. Yeah. Um, and that's why I, I like to have that like kind of backlog of nice things that people say, because it is really easy to focus on the negatives. And I think there's a lot of change that needs to happen when it comes to how we interact with people online and that sort of thing. But it's also nice to remember, okay, there are highlights to it. And if there are highlights to it, how do we create spaces that encourage that sort of discussion? Mm -hmm. And speaking of positivity, one of your uh, talks at the Game Developers Conference was about like how you've been dealing with you know, dead game comments where people are like <laughs> hating on Among Us and like yeah. you respond like very kindly, very positively. And like, 
by doing that, you managed to build like a more positive community despite getting sometimes negative comments. Could you like tell us more about that and what your thinking was? Yeah, for sure. Um, the dead game comments are, it's one of those things where I saw it less of an insult and more of just this is one the way that people talk now because again like the way the internet talks is so different so, and words change and a lot of people were saying dead game not necessarily like that they no one was playing it because we have numbers on the back end we know how we were like if this is a dead game like tell me more but also it's just that people say it when it's like, oh, like my friends aren't currently playing it because they've moved on to another game because so many great games come out all the time and that's great. Um, and just trying to create like, okay, if people are saying this, if this is going to be the dominant thing that I see and it's starting to annoy me a little bit or it's starting to get under my skin because it's like, okay, we do want to talk about other things. It's like, okay, I will talk to you as a person because that's the person we're reading this. And I think a lot of the people, when they say these things, um, there's like, you know, obviously the trolls, but there's a lot of people who just say it as like a, no one's going to see this. Like, no, one, it's, it's a comment, it's whatever. Um, and I wanted people to be like, you know what, even if you've decided to say this and you're like, I'm sticking with it and I want to be mean, like, I want you to know that you're saying it to a person. Um, and that's kind of where I went with it. It's like, even if you're mean, know that you're being mean to a person. <laughs> Yeah, and not just to the like the abyss. And it totally worked. Like a lot of them will. So oftentimes they'll be like, "Oh crap, sorry, I didn't really yeah, mean that." Yeah, it's really cute. It's it's one of those things again because honestly, I did this when I was a like a young teenager <laughs> on the internet. Like I would limit test on the internet because I'm like, why not? I would. I was clearly like the person I wouldn't want to deal with as a community manager. But I I did that because like especially in my real life, I was like, I was not going to do that. So I was like, what if I just like. I didn't say anything like horrible to be yeah, sure. Just got to yeah, put yeah. that out there. Um, but like, I would be like, what if I was like kind of a troll here? And then it would be fun. And then like someone would be like, hey, that wasn't cool. So I, oop, never mind. Right. <laughs> I've learned my lesson. <laughs> I think it's like one of the ways that young people today like are, are almost learning like internet social skills, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's one of those things where you learn social skills in person because like if someone reacts badly to something you're like oh that's my bad um but on the internet sometimes you just like you know you can ignore people and there's so many people you're like who's gonna notice and then sometimes people do <laughs> mm -hmm. okay so this is a short question but it's kind of a big question feel free to answer it like however you would like how did you grow the among us tiktok account to over four million followers <laughs> Yeah, that, this one, this one is, yeah, it's a big one and it's a mix of things. So I don't, I don't love taking credit for the entirety of growing the Among Us TikTok because obviously we had the game and it has to have had some sort of a player base and community base for so many people to want to follow on TikTok. So it's a very much a team effort. Um, in terms of like my work in growing the TikTok, it's honestly that... I tried very, whenever I join a team, whenever I join a game, I try very hard to listen to the community for like the first few weeks that I'm there. Like I'm not posting anything. I'm not really interacting. I'm just reading what they're saying. I'm reading the jokes. I'm trying to learn like the vocabulary. I'm trying to learn how people talk. I'm trying to learn the humor. I'm trying to basically become a sponge of like social interactions. Um, and when I do that, then I start creating the content. Then I start being like, okay, how am I going to integrate this into our own content? And it's a mix of like developer values, um, things that I want to do, uh, what the community wants to see, and honestly, analytics. So one of the things that people don't see when it comes to a lot of social media management is you're often tracking like, how well did my content do? And if it does well, do I want to repeat it? Um, if it doesn't do well, why didn't it do well? Is there something I can tweak? Is there something that I want to stop doing? Um, and just, it's like an obsessive, like checking over it, like over and over again and being like, okay, this worked, this didn't work, this worked, this didn't work. And then slowly you get your strategy. Um, I know people talk about like, oh, you know, post uh, quality over quantity, which I agree with, but sometimes you need the quantity in order to check like, 
oh, this is what quality means. Because sometimes people are taking guesses, take, people are taking stabs at it, and they're like, well, I'm posting quality content, it's not working. Well, like, it, if it's not working, then it, maybe it isn't the quality content you think it is. And you need to post a little bit more to see what's working. Um, that was kind of a long answer, but I hope that answered it. Yeah, it's super helpful. And for listeners and viewers, I'll link to Victoria's GDC talk on how she did it if they want to learn more. Ooh, yeah. Thank you. No, that's, I think that's really great that you are um, encouraging people to post more rather than like sort of really like refining things as you go, because it's so easy to, I don't know, as a perfectionist myself, it's so easy to like hold off, hold off until you're like, oh, I made the perfect thing. Mm -hmm. But if you post a lot and can sort of see what works and see what doesn't, especially with like algorithms that are really, no. I mean, the TikTok algorithm algorithm i think it's still it's something hard. really crazy for us to really understand as creators and consumers so mm -hmm. no one no one understands the algorithms we don't understand the algorithms you just yeah. try and it's i think it's one of those things that like a lot of people will hold themselves back because yeah it is like i need to make sure it's like the most quality content before i start posting anything because it's embarrassing to put yourself out there like yeah that. um but yeah it but the best part time to like start doing that stuff is when people don't have their eyes on you, honestly. Like mm. if I were new to community management and I had to work on Among Us stuff, I'd be like, this, I'm like sh bricks or, or sorry, I'm <laughs> uh, not having a great time right now. <laughs> but like I got a lot of my experience from like failing a bunch and not having super like, you know, putting out content that I was like, this looks great. And now I look back on it like three years later, I'm like, oh, that was really cringy. Um, but no one saw it because no one was paying attention. And that's like the greatest time to do things because you can learn so much from doing it. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's really great advice. Um, what's something you've done in your work that was completely out of your comfort zone or at least was the first time you did it? Was it Jimmy Fallon? Was it doing <laughs> panels? Um, what would you say? Um, it would be two different things. I would say one is when I first when I did my first GDC talk, so the Game Developers Conference talk, I do a lot of talks now. I do a lot of interviews now. Um, but before I was not a public speaker and I wasn't comfortable being a public speaker and I was really in my head about what kind of public speaker I wanted to be and all that sort of thing. Um, and also, I just didn't know if I had interesting things to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that would be the biggest thing like in my career, uh, in which I felt like I took a huge leap. But honestly, the Jimmy Fallon thing was a, also a very big one that I was very nervous for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can you take us behind the scenes of the Jimmy Fallon thing? Oh, no! oh who's dead? <gasps> not me. Sword killed Ray! Oh my God, not Ray! Ray! All right, I'm going to say it's uh, uh, Tariq. What, what can you share about what the setup was like? Um, and then, like, where did you guys stream to, like, for the original one? And then I know that the, the there was a video on demand that was published on his YouTube channel. Did you guys have any say in, like, who edited that? Did they have somebody on their team reach out? Like, tell us more about what happened behind the scenes. It is one of those things, again, where people are like, wow, that must have been, that was a really smart marketing move on your part. We're like, nope, they just reached out. <laughs> just, yeah. They just reached out to us and we're like, Jimmy's interested in playing Among Us. What can you tell us about it? And it's like, oh, okay. So I hopped onto a call with them. Um, we also have someone, um, Carl from Big Pigeon. He helps us with like kind of TV, movie partnership things. Um, he was on the call as well. And we basically just talked to them about the game, um, how it worked, uh, if they wanted to stream, like what that would look like. Uh, and it was honestly really hands off. It was all, it was all them, like they edited uh the clips together they did a great job at that um they talked to twitch and they figured out how to stream and all that and we gave them like tips and advice and we told them like you know try out the game this is how the game works that sort of thing i don't really think they tried out the game before they started playing <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay it was very authentic that way um and yeah it was it's one of those things where all we had to do really was tell them this is the game here are keys for the game um if you want us to hop on we're happy to and we did and yeah we got to just i i got to play uh with all of them which is really cool that yeah was that really was really cool. cool and like for you personally like 
what was the like streaming setup like? Did you guys, because I'm curious how they got the footage from each person and stuff like that to actually make the video and also the stream itself. Mm -hmm. Like, did you guys all join a, a Zoom call and then somebody used OBS to show that or how did that work? Yeah, I'm trying to, rem it's been a couple of years, so I actually don't super remember what program we used. I think it was Zoom, but it might not have been. Um but because like we had one um, streamers who are used to it, they could, you know, capture their own footage. Uh, I could capture my own footage and for everyone else. So like for the roots and for um, the stranger things actor and for Jimmy Fallon, I think they just had their own in office setup or something okay. that they just used themselves. And I'm nice. not sure what that looked like. Cause it was all remote. Um, but yeah, I was going to ask more about that too because I think it's so interesting that you guys kind of gave him, gave them the information and then you were sort of hands off because I really thought it was going to be the opposite. You guys were going to be like, okay, like this is how we're going to do this. Cause your extreme experience mm -hmm. with streaming, of course it's like TV production and everything. So they have a ton of tools at their disposal, but I guess I almost want to know what was the prep that they gave you leading into it? Because I feel like it's so, I don't know. I, um, I know people who work in TV and it's sort of like, okay, you sit at this point at this time and like you mm -hmm. wait a long time and then they tell you to say this and it's like a two minute thing. And it's just like, it's so specific. And then obviously it's, they change it so much when it goes to, TV, but with the whole age of live streaming, especially during COVID when people had to report on news remotely, mm -hmm. I wonder what sort of prep they gave you. Like, you got to get online at this time. We're going to do a check, yeah. check. Like, what did that part look like? Yeah. So it's, I think it was probably a little bit less structured because they weren't used to live streaming like mm. this was a very i think it was his first ever live stream so it was mm, not anything that they were used to um from what i remember like we did have the tech check we did have the call in, and we were there early so that you know they could make sure everything was ready but it honestly wasn't anything different from what i've been used to when it comes to any sort of live stream or uh recording online of just like arrive early make sure everything works um, and that was about it. Again, maybe there was more prep on their end because they had some in-person stuff going on. Mm. Uh, but for like me and for, I think the other streamers, it was just show up, do the tech check. Good to go. Awesome. That's awesome. That's so cool. I really respect their creative team for being like, okay, this is going to be chaotic. Like don't try exactly. to control everything. Yeah. It's great. It's great. And I think one of the nice things was because so because Innersloth and Among Us, like we're an indie studio, there's less red tape when it comes to our stuff. Like I have worked with other studios where it's like, you you cannot say this. It's very strict about this. And with Innersloth, it was like, I don't know, just go for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's so fun. That's so fun. And just for clarity, I guess, um, what is it like working with a company that has like one really popular game, but they're also looking into the future of like how they can stay super relevant in the space or I don't know, what are, what are the things they're thinking about? Cause I'm not as familiar with the game space, but I'd love to mm -hmm. know how developers think in that way, especially in the age of TikTok where things can blow up really quickly, but also die really quickly. For sure. And I think any, it depends, again, on the studio, and it depends on who's running it. Um, but I think the lovely thing about Inner Sloth, and I'm not saying a, a lot of other studios do this too. Uh, the lovely thing about Inner Sloth is just that their concern and the reason and the reason a lot of people make independent game studios is that you you just want to make a you just want to make your game ideas like that's the biggest thing like you yeah. want to create these worlds you want to create these experiences you want players to have fun playing this. So even though Among Us is huge and very grateful for sure because it helps like fund the next game and the other things that we want to do they just want to keep making games like yeah and there's there is the pressure of like okay like what is among us is like next game and all of that sort of thing um but again because like even before among us even before all everything blew up like they already had game ideas that they wanted to make they already knew what they wanted to do so like fair warning like it might not it definitely won't do as well as Among Us. I don't think anything we ever make again will be as big as Among Us, and that's okay. And honestly, it's much less terrifying to think about it that way <laughs> <laughs> because Among Us was a lot. 
Um, but yeah, the goal just continues to be like, there's game ideas that we think are really cool and that would be really fun. And we're in a really lucky place where now we don't have to like go off to find a publisher to get funding for it. Mm -hmm. Among Us does that. Um, so one is just making games that we want, making games that are fun, but two, continuing to work on Among Us so that all the people that contribute to it, all the people that had fun playing it and continue to have fun playing with it, get to have more experiences, get to create more of those um, fun lobbies and fun uh, moments that they share online. Um, it's kind of just balancing those two. No, I think that's a really fair point to say that pretty much, well, I guess it's it's hard to think that anything could be bigger than it because it came out at such a crazy point in time. Like everything sort of lined up, like mm -hmm. the rise of TikTok, the pandemic and people being home. Um, I think also the rise in popularity of streamers and playing mm -hmm. games online. It's kind of crazy that it all worked out the way it did, but in a really, really cool way, we saw a game really sort of like, I don't think I've seen anything sort of destroy the internet or like occupy people's <laughs> minds since like pokemon go or like oh, pokemon things like a good time. or even like what was the flappy bird i remember flappy bird just like <laughs> destroying bird. every like everybody's just like top of mind with flappy bird so that was that's like game developer goals your game gets so big that you're like i'm removing it <laughs> yeah, I know. Literally, it's like, I need to shut this down. This is making me yeah. depressed and I'm overwhelmed. Like, oh, my goodness. I know. Why? Yeah. It's crazy. Um, we are starting to wrap up. Um, yep. Let's do it. So we have really fun. This is like another rapid fire section. Yeah. So first one is, can you shine the spotlight on a creator you enjoy watching? Like, who? oh, like, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I was like, let me rephrase that. I was like, who's a content creator that you really enjoy watching? Um, oh, can I do two? Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. I'm cheating. <laughs> no, you're um, fine. So since like high school, I've been watching Dex Bonus. Um, I think she was press hard to continue on YouTube for a while. I still watch her. She's amazing. She's great. Um, there is also uh, Kim Chika. She does, she's a, a senior influencer manager at Kepler Interactive currently, but she's also a content creator and she does that nice thing of like being both a dev and a content creator. And I think she has really nice insight into things. That's super cool. Awesome. What's uh, a piece of content or a game that you're currently obsessed with? Ooh, I have just started playing Backpack Hero. It's very good. It's like an inventory management puzzle game where like depending on how you combine different items touching each other, like you get different uh, upgrades and stuff. Uh, also Dredge. Dredge is a game that I am so surprised I loved because I hate horror games, but this one was so good. That's awesome. <laughs> I can go for, into it. For Backpack Heroes, is that is that kind of like Tetris? That's good. Yeah, it's sort of, uh, it's more like, it's, it's, Sort of. It's sort of. Yeah, it's sort of like Tetrising in like different items together. Okay. Yes. Okay, got it. Got it. Um, any final words you want to leave the audience with? Um, not really, but <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no, goodbye. Uh, no, I will say, I think that whether it's streamers, whether it's community managers, whether it's like game studios, we're all kind of creating our own communities. And I think sometimes we get really caught up in being like, oh, we're so different and we're like, you know, at odds with each other. But I, it's one of those things where I've met so many wonderful content creators. I've met so many wonderful studios. I've met so many wonderful community managers. And I think when we're all working together and trying to create communities that help each other, um, that's always really nice and really fun. And I hope we can continue to do that. Yay. I love Yay. that. Cheesy. <laughs> I know. Oh my God. Mo's Mac you had update. The heart thing. <laughs> oh. Yeah. He does this and it does the thumbs up. Where can people find you on the internet? Yes. You can find me on Twitter slash X slash whatever it is um, at the VTran. But the better place to find me uh, is victoriatran.com. I have all of my socials there. I write a monthly community developer newsletter uh, and I have different articles there. So. Check it out yeah. if you're interested. Awesome. awesome. Thanks so much for being on the show. This was a joy. Thank you. Super fun. This episode was recorded with StreamYard. If you want to record a podcast like this, check out the link in the description to get started. And if you want to leave us a voice message through Spotify, we'll leave a link to that in the description as well. Thanks for joining us on Inside the Creator Studio. See you next time.